Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I may cordially welcome you to today's lecture, which is brought to you through EU Food Star, the European Food Studies and Training Alliance. My name is Christine Krabler. I'm a food technologist working in LVA since 1999. LVA is an institute for knowledge transfer and innovation management. We are situated in Austria and we realize projects for the Austrian food sector. We do product developments and process research. It is my pleasure to guide you through this afternoon webinar and I will make you acquainted with some features of this webinar tool first. So let me first uh, show you the agenda. I will do a short introduction on how to use your control panel, then introduce to you the Foodstar project. This will be followed by the presentation by our today's lecturers. You will have the opportunities to post your questions and they will follow an evaluation by email. This is the control panel that you should see on the right hand side of your screen. There is maybe the most important field, this text field, where you can post your questions. I'm really in favor of written questions, also you can also po post them orally, but written questions are usually easier to handle for me and easier to administrate and also easier to understand. So I would like to ask you to post your questions in this field written. You have here an error which is, uh, has the function to minimize the panel. This icon lets you uh, 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 um, uh, resize the presentation to full screen. By this icon you can virtually raise your hand and make me aware that you have a question or something to say. And this would be your micro which you can mute and unmute yourself to. But I would really be in favor of having all attendees' micros muted due to feedback and interferences. And I will be able to pose your questions to the lecturers if you write them to me in the text field. The session will be recorded and made available afterwards through our project website. So let me give you a short introduction about the EU Foodstar, the Food Studies and Training Alliance. It is an Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliance project and is, uh, has a duration from January 2015 to December 2017. Gerhard Schleining, through whose channel I am talking to you today, is the coordinator of the project. He is located at the POCO in Vienna in Austria. What is the vision of the Foodstar project? We see universities who have their knowledge transferred in food studies and we see food industry with their knowledge uh, somehow laid back in practices and day-to-day uh, -day practice. There's a focus on research in universities and a focus on publications but there is very much practical applications and quick solutions for our food industry. These different approaches do obviously have a certain gap and the vision of the Foodstar project is to close this gap and bring practical and theoretical knowledge together. Long-term partnerships on European level shall be established and we try to do this by simple goals and not too high expectations. The partners of the Foodstar project are spread all over Europe. They are located in seven universities, three food companies and 11 multipliers and training providers. The consortium consists of the following universities located in Austria, France, Portugal, Germany, the UK and Italy. 
The food companies who are supporting our project are Frulact in Portugal, GB Foods in Spain and Nestle in Switzerland. A large part of the consortium is built up by the multipliers and training providers. Lebensmittelversuchsanstalt, LVA, is one of them. We have other representatives for the industry from France, Italy, Spain, Greece and Portugal and also associated members like the teachers of IFA and the industry and students from EFOST, SPES and EROICA. The Foodstar project is not only a virtual one, we also have physical hubs. We want to establish an independent platform and the physical centers are located all over Europe, Europe, for example in Leeds, in Hohenheim, in Vienna, in Porto, Paris, Teramo and Barcelona. We are open for your suggestions. We are developing food study curricula and we would be happy to get your feedback via office at iseki-food.net. So it's time to switch to the presentations of today's afternoon. We have two speakers today. Speaker number one is Paula Texera. She is an assistant professor for food microbiology at the University Católica in Portugal. She is a graduate of the Universidad, uh, Universidade Católica Portuguesa and is uh, a food engineer and a biotechnologist. She has a lot of experience with coordinating and participating in div diverse research projects and we are looking forward to the knowledge you will be parting with us today. Mr. Paul Gibbs is a consultant. He has a FD in germination of clostridial spores, I'm sorry, and has also wide experience with research topics, with spores, with culture of vaccines, and is also involved in EC-funded projects and has long-term experience with, mod with microbiology in food and drinks. So I would like to hand over now to our two-day speakers. Please give me some minutes to do this. So you should now be able to show your screen, Paul and Paula. Well, good afternoon, everybody from Porto, where it is nice and warm and sunny. Welcome to our seminar webinar today on, food, on spore forming bacteria in foods. Bacterial spores are among the most difficult to destroy in foods, being resistant to heat, radiation, chemicals, including disinfectants and sterilizing agents, acids, dehydration, and uh, in also resistant to high pressures, a technique which is being used more frequently in the food industry now. The group of spore-forming bacteria, Bacillus and Clostridium are the main genera, contains both spoilage and pathogenic organisms, the latter by production of some of the most powerful natural toxins known. Spoilage species cause problems in heat-treated foods, for example pasteurized products, and also canned or fully heat-processed products. Alicyclobacillus is a genus of spoilage bacteria causing contamination of fruit juices and other beverage products that cannot easily be contaminated by other organisms because of their high acid contents. Growth of this organism results in a very smoky flavour of, of citrus juices particularly and has been the cause of great losses to that industry. There are also several species that can be very useful, for example, insect pathogens that have been used as biological pesticides. Some 
Australia produce useful products, products from sugar metabolism, propanol, butanol, acetone, etc. And also, you can extract vitamin B complex from cells after the fermentation. The heat resistances of bacterial spores varies quite widely. For example, Bacterinum type E, the psychotrophic strain, at D100 is only 0.01 minute, whereas type A, a mesophilic proteolytic species, has a D100 of somewhere between 7 and 30 minutes. Bacillus caeculans, a D100 of 20 to 30 minutes. Bacillus stereothermophilus, 100 to 160 minutes and it has a D at 120 degrees centigrade of somewhere between 1 and 6 minutes depending on the strain. In general, the thermophiles are more heat resistant than the mesophilic species and the psychotrophs. So spores may be detected or isolated by heating a sample suspension at 75 centigrade for about 10 minutes or for the very heat sensitive spores by adding 50% alcohol for 30 minutes before plating or adding to a liquid medium. Food poisoning is a result of ingestion of preformed toxin in food or toxin production during growth in the gastrointestinal tract. Spoilage of canned foods is either by production of acids alone, such as Bacillus stereothermophilus in low acid foods, or vigorous gas and hydrogen sulfide production as by the Clostridia. Several species of spawformers also cause animal and human infections. For example, anthrax by Bacillus anthracis, tetanus by Clostridium tetani, gas gangrene by Clostridium perfringens, and some other species of Clostridia, and severe infections of skin and underlying muscles in cattle and sheep caused by Clostridium septicum, Clostridium edematiens. Young calves and lambs are generally immunised against these infections shortly after birth. During formation of spores, within a mother cell, and is correctly referred to as bacterial endospores, to differentiate them from old spores that are formed by splitting of a separate structure, the central part of the spore or containing the DNA and other essential components for the formation of a vegetative cell or germination are dehydrated. Dry organic components are very much more heat resistant than hydrated compounds. The outer protein coat contains a large number of cross-linked cysteine residues that can absorb ionizing radiation with little or no damage to the structure. Similarly, chemical resistance is also conferred by this type of structure. Germination of spores is suitable in suitable environments can be very rapid, less than five minutes, during which period almost all of the spore characteristics are lost, such as brightness, resistance to staining, heat, chemical and radiation resistance, and metabolic activity increases rapidly. Germination does not require a full complement of nutrients. An aerobic or anaerobic conditions and so on, since in many cases, force can germination on addition of, for example, alanine. Clostridial spores do not require an aerobic conditions to germinate. Heat shock, such as 8 degrees centigrade for 10 minutes, usually increases both the speed of germination and the proportion of spores in a population that will germinate. Formation of the first vegetative cell, outgrowth, usually requires about two to three times the normal generation time. The first observable, the letter microscope, indicating indication that sporulation has commenced is the formation of a binucleate cell that an axial nuclear filament. An asymmetric membrane then separates the brief spore, spore nuclear material from the rest of the mother cell, and the new membrane develops to completely surround the brief spore nucleus within the mother cell. Around this cortex begins to develop. 
a thick peptidoglycan structure that differs chemically from the normal cell wall material and support the hydration to commence. Full UV and some chemical resistance appears at this time. The proteinaceous pore coat is then laid down around the cortex, dehydration continues, chemical resistance increases, and resistance to ionizing radiation appears. At the next stage, typicolimic acid is synthesized and developed cations, cations mainly calcium but also magnesium uh, and manganese, are accumulated to a high concentration. Full resistance and spore dormancy is achieved. The mother cell is then lysed, internal lysins, to release the few fully mature spore. Bacillus species, although most species will grow anaerobically, will only form spores in the presence of oxygen to provide the large amounts of energy necessary by using the tricarboxylic acid pathway. The pH of a sugar-containing medium falls during vegetative growth, then rises during oxidation of the organic acids formed, mainly is lactate. Bacillus species are responsible for food poisoning, animal, human and insect diseases, and also food spoilage. Clostridium species will only sporulate anaerobically, <coughs> although a few species can tolerate oxygen for a short time. Species of Clostridia are responsible for some serious diseases of humans and animals, tetanus, gas gangrene, botulism, for example. But also some cause food spoilage, generally of food, canned foods which have been under processing. Others have been used to produce mixed solvents by fermentation of sugars and even B vitamins from the cells after fermentation. The Sulfatomaculum nigrificans previously called Clostridium nigrificans, is responsible for sulphide spoilage of canned foods. This organism is differentiated from Clostridia by being able to reduce sulfate to sulfide. Clostridia can only reduce sulfite to sulfide. Clostridium botulinum and other species that are capable of producing botulinum toxin for example, certain strains of Clostridium butyricum and Clostridium barati are responsible for the neuroparalytic intoxication botulism of humans and animals. Some strains of Clostridium perfringens, formerly known as Clostridium welshii, are responsible for food poisoning, while others can cause gas gangrene, necrosis of the intestine, and other serious infections of man and animals. Spores of toxigenic Clostridium difficile and spores of food poisoning strains of Clostridium perfringens show a similar prevalence in meats. Spores of both species are heat resistant and can survive cooking of foods. Clostridium perfringens is a major cause of foodborne illnesses but studies are needed to determine whether Clostridium difficile transmission by a similar route is a cause of foodborne infection. In particular, for isolating this organism, strictly anaerobic conditions are essential. The seven toxin types of botulinum are differentiated on the basis of the individual immunological reactions of the toxins. The two broad groups differentiated on the basis of proteolytic abilities, but also the non-proteolytic group are psychotrophic. Spores of the proteolytic group are more heat resistant than those of the non-proteolytic group. But as the former strains cannot grow at refrigeration temperatures, pasteurized foods must be kept chilled and with a limited shelf life. Toxin type D affects cattle, horses, and some fish, for example, farmed trout. Type C affects birds, sometimes causing the deaths of large numbers of water birds in summer months when water levels are low, and many of the insects and other small invertebrates die from dehydration. And type strains of type C grow in the corpses that are then ingested by the birds and suffer from botulism. 
Cases of botulism are rare in the UK, but more common in many other European countries and worldwide. Whenever there are poor food preservation practices, example mistakes in canning processes, poor or slow fermentation of foods, such as fermented fish, lack of sugars for lactic acid to ferment, high moisture, high water activity, low salt levels in cured foods and so on, there is the opportunity for contamination and growth and toxin formation by Clostridium botulinum. The organisms are ubiquitous, particularly prevalent in soil, although not necessarily in large numbers. Their resistant spores enable them to survive heat, sanitizing agents, disinfectants, and so on. Botulinum toxins are amongst the most lethal natural toxins known. Active immunization against the toxins is possible, but only recommended for those known to be exposed to the toxins, such as laboratory staff working with the organisms, although any isolation of Clostridia from fruits in the laboratory should be treated with care. The earlier the typical symptoms appear, the larger the dose of toxin ingested and the more difficult to treat successfully. Treatment is by intravenous administration of antitoxin, antiserum, but if the toxin has already attacked the nerval muscle cell junctions, this will be ineffective, only serving to neutralize any remaining circulating toxin. In extreme cases, artificial respiratory support will be necessary. The brain and heart are affected as their neuronal signaling is by a different mechanism. Improper cured and smoked meat and fish products saw too low, less than 3.5% 3 5, 3 high water activity, higher than 0.94 for group 1 strains or higher than 0.97 for group 2 strains. Storage temperatures to high are common causes of botulism in Central and Southern Europe and Eastern and Mediterranean countries. Dairy products are rarely implicated in botulism, but ingesting in ingredients added to it to, for example, yogurt, can be a source of the toxin or organisms if improperly processed. UK cases of hazelnut puree added to plain yogurt are an example. The puree had high water activity, high pH, and was processed similarly to a jam conserve. I mean, with low pH and low water activity and pasteurization conditions at about 95 degrees for 10 minutes. Vegetables if stored for long periods can permit growth of botulinum and toxin production. Poor canning practices of vegetables, home canning in the USA, for example, has led to several cases of botulism. This has generally been due to insufficient control over time and temperatures of canning in the home. There has been concern about the potential of botulism in infant feeds, either for contamination of milk powders or from honey. Powder-based feeds rehydrated and held at warm room temperatures, night feeds, for example, can potentially permit toxin production if the organisms are present as spores. Pasteurization, drying and heating in the home are insufficient to kill the spores. Batches of honey from California have been implicated in infant botulism, infection of the G tract of babies with toxin production, from honey fed in dummies or had to infant feeds as sweetener. Examples of written outbreaks are present in this slide. Authorities in Germany and Spain have reported six cases of foodborne type B botulism associated with the consumption of dried salted fish in November December 2016. The first two German cases have been at the fish from separate locations of the same chain of grocery stores. 
which received it from a producer in the Netherlands. Both Spanish cases had eaten dried and salted rock, which was distributed from an unnamed Spanish wholesaler and manufactured by the same Dutch producer. Public health officials in the US state of Ohio have identified potato salad made with home canned potatoes as the most likely cause of an outbreak of botulism that has affected people who attended a church potluck in Lancaster on 19th April 2015. The attendee who prepared the potato salad with home canned potatoes reported using a boiled water canner, which does not destroy spores, rather than a pressure canner, which does eliminate spores. In addition, the potatoes were not heated after removal from the can, a step that can destroy botulinum toxin. This was the largest botulism outbreak in the United States in the nearly 40 years. Four confirmed cases of botulism in Portugal were linked to the consumption of a particular brand of smoked sausage and cheese. No death were reported. Very recently, an undisclosed disclosed number of illnesses in Canada have been linked to a PC Organics brand, Baby Food, spurring global companies to recall several products because of risk of botulism poisoning. According to the recall notice posted on the, Ca the Canadian uh, Health um, uh, Agency, a manufacturing error resulted in a Resulted in excess, sorry, resulted in excess water in the product, which under certain circumstances could support the growth of Clostridium botulinum and pose a health risk to consumers. A trial vlog kill of the most heat-resistant spores of Clostridium botulinum was accepted as providing a large margin of safety for the canning of those foods capable of supporting growth and toxin by Clostridium botulinum. From the data derived by Estienne Mayer way back in 1929 on devalues for the most heat resistant spores of the botulinum that they could produce, a D at 121 degrees centigrade of 0.2 minutes was derived. Therefore, a 12 log kill was achieved in 2.4 minutes. This is rounded up to three minutes at 121 centigrade, or the equivalent, used, calculated using appropriate Z values for temperatures below 121 centigrade. Since spores of botulinum cannot germinate, grow and produce toxin at pH values of less than 4.6, only foods with pH values of greater than 4.6, the so-called low acid foods, must be subjected to a botulinum cook. This time temperature combination is referred to as the scheduled process and must be adhered to at all times for a particular product and pack size. The time temperature necessary is for the slowest heating point in the pack, not necessarily the geometric center of the pack and the rate of heating is critically dependent upon the fluidity or solid nature of the pack contents, that is for convective or conductive heating, the latter being considerably slower than the former. So pack contents must be carefully controlled to prevent a pack containing less fluid than was used in deriving the scheduled process. It should be remembered that botulinum spores are not the most heat resistant and that although a can may be free of viable botulinum spores, it may not be sterile and could still spoil through the growth of, for example, Bacillus stereothermophilus. The combined effects of temperature, pH, water activity or salt on water, nitrite, etc. on growth and toxin production have been incorporated into various mathematical predictive models. The toxins of botulinum are secreted from cells and as a single polypeptide that is non-toxic 
until a masking peptide is cleaved by proteolytic action. In the proteolytic species, this is achieved by the bacterial cells and protease, but with the non-proteolytic species, a toxin is generally fully activated in the patient's stomach by trypsin. When testing a sample for the presence of toxin, it is usual practice to activate any toxin present by incubating with trypsin for about an hour at 37 centigrade. The mechanism of action, blockade of acetylcholine release at the nerve muscle synapse and hence paralysis of the muscle has been known for several years, but this has been studied in more detail only recently uh, as indicated in the slide. The specific peptidase activity is now being researched as a potential non-animal based test for the presence of botulinal toxins. Control of the growth of the psychotrophic strains is more easily attained by physicochemical means than that of the mesophilic proteolytic strains. With a minimum growth temperature of three degrees centigrade, a growth inhibitory temperature cannot realistically be maintained in a commercial chill chain, let alone in a domestic situation. So other inhibitory parameters must be present. At temperatures of less than 10 degrees centigrade, the mesophilic strains can grow, sorry, at temperatures above 10 centigrade, the mesophilic strains can grow and control requires lower levels of pH and water activity to achieve control. There are no specific selective indicator media for detection of Clostridium botulinum. Detection relies upon detection of toxin in a liquid culture medium. On Egyogagar, some strains will produce a weak zone of precipitation due to the lecithinase reaction on egg yolk, but this is common among many other species of Clostridia. <coughs> Enrichment at less than 10 degrees centigrade will permit growth and toxin production only by the group two strains, the non-proteolytic strains. The time of incubation should not be less than 10 days. A temperature of 30 degrees centigrade will permit growth and toxin productions by both groups one and two strains. Strains of botulinum are not fastidious in their growth requirements a meat-based medium is sufficient for growth and toxin production. At present, toxin production is detected by intra-abdominal injection into mice and production of typical paralytic symptoms within three days, much less if a lot of toxin is present. Diagnosis of the toxin type is by specific neutralization of the toxic effects by pre-incubating the toxin the single toxin-specific antisera, followed by mouse injection. Protection from the toxic effect by one antiserum indicates the toxin type. It is general, generally unusual and quite difficult to isolate and purify strains of Clostridium from botulinum from foods, and it is certainly not recommended for non-immunised personnel. Clostridium perfusions type, type A food poisoning is much less hazardous than botulism, although still very unpleasant. Only certain strains of the organism can produce the enterotoxin, which is produced during an infection of the gastrointestinal tract. The abdominal pain is associated with both vigorous gas production during growth of the organism and rapid ingress of water into the intestinal lumen as a result of the action of the toxin, resulting in severe but a relatively short period of diarrhea. The aggression of the patient is common and may lead to the death of early elderly patients if already weakened. As the effective dose is high, Control of the growth of the organism, for example, at low temperatures, proper heat treatments, low pH and low water activity will minimize any potential for cases of food poisoning. There is a rare necrotic infection of G-Trek, also known as Darmbrand, 
or pig belt, as it is associated with pig meat that has been undercooked in more primitive societies that is also caused by different strana or sweeping perfringions. The most common sources of perfringion food poisoning are meat and meat products, as the organism is common in intestinal contents of men and domestic animals, including poultry. However, the occurrence of food poisoning strains in animals is yet to be proven. The causes of outbreaks are generally traceable to underheat processing combined with storage at inadequately low temperatures for extended periods of time. Outbreaks are often associated with large scale catering where it is difficult to adequate heat process and shield rapidly enough to minimize growth of the organism. Cooking of large pieces of meat should be restricted to not larger than about 4 to 5 kilograms and if not to be sliced and served immediately, broken down in portions of about 250 50, 500 grams and shield rapidly. For example, by sealing in a vacuum bag and immersion in agitated shield water. Meat for serving should not be held at temperatures of about 45 degrees, as the organism still grows very rapidly in these conditions, with a doubling time of about 10 minutes. The organism is a mesophile, but with a high maximum growth temperature. The growth rate is one of the most rapid known. The spores are not particularly heat resistant. There are rare reports of costume perfringing and teratoxin being formed in foods, but this has largely are as rarely led to food poisoning. Although the food poison type A strains correlate readily in g tract sporulation in normally laboratory meat is very rare, but can sometimes be achieved by special techniques. For example, adding raffinose to the growth medium. Examples of recent outbreaks are shown in this slide. A Thanksgiving Day meal served by a church group in Antioch, California that killed three people was evidently contaminated with the bacteria Clostridium perfringens. Eating chicken body was the likely cause of an outbreak of Clostridium perfringens in a large secondary school in London. Microbiological analysis confirmed that Clostridium perfringens was the causative organism in this outbreak. It was not possible to establish what factors may have contributed as a environmental investigation revealed of satisfactory processes and procedures. The kitchen inspection and the review of the cooking pan temperature recordings revealed no evidence, no evidence of poor hygiene or poor temperature control during the preparation of food. So, an inadequate temperature control of food after initial cooking may have contributed to this outbreak. Clostridium perfringens in beef stew that had inadequate temperature control during preparation was the most probable cause of an outbreak that affected more than 43 participants from several swimming clubs attending a swimming competition in Norway. There are some good selective indicator plating media for clostridium perfringens. But don't forget, incubation must be anaerobic. Most probable number techniques in liquid media, e.g. sulphide ion containing broths, can be quite useful, but detection and isolation of the organism must be done on selective indicator agars. Low numbers do not generally indicate a food poisoning dose. Although the early version of tryptosulfite cyproserine agar contained egg yolk as an indicator of production of lecithin A's, evidenced by white precipitate around the colonies, this egg yolk interfered with the activity of the selective agents. OPSP 
although recommended by some authors, is found not to be as good as the egg yolk free TSC. Similarly, SFP, neomycin blood agar, as favoured by clinical microbiologists, and SPS agar, again, are not as good as egg yolk free TSC. Several selective agents have been identified as valuable for the selective isolation of this organism, although most of them rely upon sulphide blackening, sulphite reduced to sulphide and reaction with iron salts to produce the insoluble black iron sulphide as an indicator. Some incorporate egg yolk for the lecithinase reaction. Blood is lysed by the action of lecithinase and hence can be used as an indicator of the presence of the enzyme, previously called the alpha toxin. The most commonly used liquid media contain sulphite and iron, such as the differential reinforced clostridial medium. The organism is not fastidious in growth requirements, growing well in protein digests with some additional vitamins from yeast extract and some glucose. The organism is primarily saccharolytic in its metabolism. In milk-based medium, the rapid formation of acid and gas from lactose, i.e. it's lactose positive, results in a stormy clot of the casein with a comparatively clear whey. There is no digestion of the coagulated casein by clostridium perfringent as it is only weakly proteolytic on gelatin. Other clostridia, however, actively digest the casein. Only a relatively small number of tests is required to identify a pure culture of clostridium perfringens. Unusually for clostridia, perfringens is non-motile. A medium called lactose egg yolk milk agar has proved a most useful identification medium based on lactose fermentation to acid, lecithinase production visualized by egg yolk precipitation, non lipolytic no pearly layer of fat produced around the colonies, and no proteolytic activity on the milk or the egg yolk. Clostridium difficile is a major cause of illness in hospitals and other healthcare institutions. Nevertheless, recent advances using whole genome sequencing have demonstrated that the majority of cases are community acquired. The source of community acquired Clostridium difficile infections is open to debate, with foodborne being one group considered. As other Clostridia, as referred to Fringes and Patulano, are well established foodborne pathogens that do lend support to Clostridium difficile following the same rules. Clostridium difficile fits the criteria of a foodborne pathogen with the respect to being commonly encountered in a diverse range of foods that includes meat, seafood, and fresh products. However, no foodborne illness outbreak have been directly linked to Clostridium difficile, nor conclusive evidence that its pores can germinate in food matrices. This does not exclude, however, food as a potential vehicle, but it is likely that the pathogen is also acquiring, acquired through zoonosis in the environment. Available data cannot be considered a true prevalence given the limited sampling size used, along with different methodologies and tendency for studies that fail to recover the pathogen not being published. It should be highlighted that this organism is strictly anaerobic and oxygen sensitive, so a catalytic anaerobic pack should always be used. Nevertheless, it should also be noted that those studies where Costiven difficile was recovered, there was a need for enrichment indicating low levels of the pathogen. Therefore, Methods to detect low levels of Clostridium difficile in foods are needed or need to be improved. 
Growth of clostridium perfusions and clostridium botulinum in foods is commonly, but not exclusively, a prerequisite for both pathogens to cause foodborne illness. The extent to which this applies to clostridium difficile remains unknown, although it should be noted that spores rather than vegetative cells need to be ingested to cause the infection. There remain large knowledge gaps with respect to growth ranges of this clostridium difficile in foods. Some species of bacillus are pathogenic for animals or insects. Bacillus anthracis causes anthrax in animals and men, rapidly developing blood infection or skin abscesses, while bacillus thuringiensis and other closely related species infect and cause the deaths of 13 insects, for example, bacillus popilii, or bees, bacillus thuringiensis, and parrots of certain species of caterpillars or butterflies and petals. Indeed, the latter have been used as biological control insecticides, although there is some concern about some strains as they may also be responsible for food poisoning. Bacillus cereus and some closely related spe species can synthesize as toxins responsible for two distinct types of food poisoning, emetic and terogenic. The emetic response is quite rapid, often on the way home from a restaurant, and is the result of ingestion of a pre food toxin in food. A common vehicle is pre-cooked rice that has been held for a long time at an appropriate temperature. Example, overnight in a large pan, after cooking, and only reheated as in fried rice. That's why sometimes we talk about the Chinese restaurant syndrome. The thyrogenic syndrome is more generally associated with meat containing diseases, but combined with a cereal as in meatballs or a meat and potato pie. In both cases, the infected dose is high, emetic syndrome requiring large numbers to synthesize an emetic dose. Although the symptoms are unpleasant, they are not lethal, although some dehydration may follow. The characteristics of the emetic vomiting toxin have only comparatively recently been described, determined largely resulting from small cyclic peptide structure. The toxin is very heat, acid and protease stable, unlike the majority of small peptides and proteins, originally thought to be a lipid in fact. The ring structure consists of three repeats of four amino acids, leucine, alanine, valine and valine and is closely related to the inophore valionomycin. The only test available so far for the this detection is speculation of HEP2 cells. Different research groups have isolated and characterized proteins with different properties from different strains of enterotoxigenic strains of the organism and there is some debate currently about the specific enterotoxic activity of each of these. It appears that the combination of components of the enterotoxic complex are probably needed for full enterotoxic activity. Only one of these components is assayed by the oxide reverse passive latex agglutination reagent. However, it has been shown that the amount of toxin detected by this kit is not correlated with cytotoxicity. Similarly, the tegre monoabsorbent assay kit does not detect toxin proteins, although the result is correlated with toxicity. Bacillus cereus is a normal inhabitant of soil and therefore contaminates most crops. However, it seems to have a predilection for cereals, especially rice. The spore resists boiling, are heat activated, and during slow cooling germinate at temperatures 
about 45 to 50 degrees centigrade and begin rapid vegetative growth during continued slow cooling. Emetitoxin is produced during this rapid growth, which is not destroyed by subsequent room heating. Production of thermogenic enterotoxin and human cases are more associated with meat and vegetable dishes, although a cereal used as a thickening agent may have been the source of the spores. Although there are well-known psychotropic toxigenic strain of Bacillus cereus, they are quite slow growing at refrigeration temperatures. Refrigeration slows growth sufficiently for most strains so that spoilage by other organisms occurs prior to toxin production. The spores of the mesophilic strains are not particularly heat resistant. There are good selective indicator plating media generally based upon similar ingredients although at different concentrations. <clears throat> Manitol is included as Bacillus cereus does not ferment this carbohydrate, whereas almost all other species of Bacillus do so. Polymyxin is a good selective agent for Bacillus species as it is produced by poly Bacillus polymyxa. Bacillus cereus produces a lecithinase, which causes a white precipitation of egg proteins and lipids around colonies. This rapid staining technique is a quick and almost unequivocal method for confirming the presence of Bacillus cereus and is dependent upon the accumulation of a reserve material within the cells when grown on a rich medium. The reserve material, thought to be a lipid but may be a polyphosphate, stains with Sudan and black. Microscopic observation of the stained cells as above is almost completely characteristic of the Bacillus cereus. With the knowledge that the oxoid RPLA kit does not detect toxicity nor can be correlated with toxicity and that the Tecra kit detects a protein that is not toxic although correlated with toxicity, results from these assay kits should be treated with some caution. Only cell assays or monkey feeding trials can detect the emetic cereolide toxin. We should note that Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus lichenniformis, and Bacillus thuringiensis can also be associated with food poisoning. The last species being used as a crop insecticide arouses particular concern as it may be present on crops at quite high numbers. Bacillus thuringiensis and other closely related insect pathogens can be differentiated by production of a parasporal crisp protein crystal within the mother cell at sporulation. This is readily visible in phase contrast microscopy. This protein crystal is lethal for the target insects, but not for humans or other pathogen, other animals. Summarizing our set webinar, the basic characteristics are that all species of spore forming predict, predictors end spores that are heat, chemical and radiation resistant to different degrees. Certain species called food poisoning and intoxication, some of which is very severe. Some other species cause specific types of food spoilage and several species cause diseases of man, insects and domestic animals. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have learned a little about spore forming organisms and their importance in foods. Thank you for your attention and any questions we'll be happy to try and answer them for you. Oh, thank you Paul and Paula for your lecture. The question refers to the, the spores. The question is if a spore has the DNA to generate a full bacteria again. 
is if a spore has DNA to generate the full bacteria again? Yes, it has. Yes, of course. If the spore germinates, even with the minimal requirements for germination, and is then found to be in a suitable medium, it will grow quite rapidly from the germinated spore. But it does take two, three times as long as the normal generation time. Don't forget that the spore has to generate all the materials to be contained within a vegetative cell, and this takes some time. And, and in fact, spores are a form of preserving bacterial DNA. Yes. Then there is a second question. Is there a risk of Clostridium food poisoning from vacuum-packed raw fresh fish? So it's vacuum-packed and raw fresh fish. Is there vacuum a risk packed, sorry? of Clostridium? Is of there what product? Raw fresh fish vacuum-packed. Yeah, the, the risk is, is as, as fish uh, contains um, clostridium in the, the, the intestines, toxins can be produced uh, under, uh, in the absence of oxygen. So, in vacuum packed conditions, this can happen. In fact, the psychotrophic strains, clostridium botulinum type E, were initially discovered when the Norwegian, the Scandinavian countries started to uh, pasteurize and then vacuum pack fish from the Baltic Sea. Now we know that the uh, Baltic Sea um, floor is covered with botulinum type E, and in the summer months, in the small fjords in Denmark, for example, Clostridium botulinum type E grows so well in decaying uh, animal material that the mud itself becomes toxic. So it's dangerous to swim in those environments. Okay, no good news. Well, I have another question. I also forward them to you in the written form, so it may be better to understand them. But I read them out for everybody to hear them. So, if you have this Clostridium risk, what are the measures to control it? What measures can be put in place to control the Clostridium risk in vacuum-packed raw fish? In, that, in raw fish, then you cannot apply much in the way of control. Uh, you're not going to heat the fish. Um, the only way of controlling it is by keeping the temperatures very low, and we've already said that 3 degrees centigrade is not realistically attainable, certainly not in a domestic refrigerator. Um, the only way of controlling the psychotrophic strains other than very low temperatures is by addition of salt, and by that, um, that treatment or addition the fish is no longer fresh, of course. It is preserved or semi-preserved. Yeah, and even if um, the intention is to, to store uh, fresh fish under vacuum packaging conditions for short times, it is very important that the fish is really fresh. Mm -hmm. So, there are several questions now coming in. The next one, do you think that Clostridium botulinum represents a relevant risk in dairy products? So are dairy products risky for Clostridium? Uh, in general, dairy products are not very susceptible to botulinum. We don't know why. But if you add materials to, for example, yogurt or to flavoured milks, that sort of uh, type of product, which does contain botulinum, then the conditions within that product, the mixed product, can be uh, sufficient to allow botulinum to grow and produce toxin. It is unusual, 
the big case in the UK of several years ago was actually caused by the addition of hazelnut puree, uh, which had only been processed in much the same way as a jam made from fruit, which has a low pH and a lot of sugar, so a low AW. Nut puree has a high pH, above 6 usually, and a high water activity of about 0.98. So the conditions in that puree, in fact, in any nut puree, there are conditions for botulinum to grow. And the way the nuts are harvested, often by falling onto the soil uh, and picking up spores of botulinum, does allow the organism to gain access to the puree, grow and produce toxin. I also remember another uh case, I'm not quite sure if it was an outbreak of um, botulan botulism caused by um, ingestion of tiramisu that was produced uh, with um, the cheese used in the production of tiramisu is a uh, uh, high pH cheese and I remember a case in a few years ago but these are not uh, common. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are another one, two, three, four, five, six questions. What about Peni bacillus species? Peni bacillus. Are they important in food products? What? Are they the cause of? I I sent you the question too. Maybe you can read it. I don't know this bacillus too. It's P A E N I. Sorry, we cannot read. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I forwarded the question to you, you should have received it. Yeah, it is. yeah let's see if we can. I cannot. In, in, uh, is this, in India, people don't care while eating, but how they get saved from these bacteria. Have they developed immunity in themselves that protect them from these toxins? It is possible, <laughs> but it seems unlikely because the symptoms of a lot of these toxins are really quite severe. Um, one of the things that may protect them, and I've not really seen any meaningful evidence, is that producing uh, foods with a lot of spices in them, such as in um, um, Indian, many Indian and uh, Pakistani foods, may inhibit the growth of these sorts of organisms, Bacillus and Clostridium. Some of the essential oils of spices are actually quite good antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. So, next question. What about cytotoxic bacillus cereus? Are they part of emetic and uh, DRO group, or is this a third separate group to be considered? Yes. Sorry, we can't um, expand the, the, um, the questions. answered questions. Ah, here we are. No. That's a bit better. No, you can't answer the question in written form, but you should be able to, to see them and to see them in written form. I forwarded them and you should see them in the part question, which is part of the panel in the lower part. Right, okay. I think it may be in India as well that um, the, the, the population becomes quite used to suffering from gastrointestinal upsets and don't necessarily uh, correlate those with bacterial infections or intoxications. 
I may be entirely wrong, but that's a possibility. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we got the next question. Okay. Cytotoxic bacillus serious, part of emetic and diarrhoeogenic, or is there a third separate group to be considered? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. There are, there are some strains can produce both toxins, other strains only produce one or the other toxin. I don't think there's a third separate group to be considered, other than non-toxin formers. Mm -hmm. The series intoxicate uncooked sprouted grains like rice. Um, from the uncooked rice, um, the water activity of uncooked rice, the dry rice, the water activity is very low and the characteristics of Bacillus cereus would not permit it to grow under those low water activities. It's only when the rice is cooked and takes up a lot of moisture uh, and the uh, water activity uh, rises quite rapidly that the Bacillus cereus can then germinate and grow. Can you tell me the official methodology on quorum sensing in sporulation? Hard question. There is <laughs> quorum sensing. There is some studies in the UK at Nottingham University uh, on quorum sensing um, and it seems that the organisms do produce a quorum sensing molecule that initiates sporulation in a large proportion of the population. Um, I can't remember the name of the group, but if you look up the University of Nottingham um, microbiology group, you will certainly find some uh, papers on that side of, of quorum sensing. It's a very interesting area. Mm -hmm. Next. Next question, Clostridium butyricum. Yeah. It is only it's only very few strains of butyricum and barati uh, that can produce botulinal toxin. Um, I'm not sure it would you would consider it as an emerging uh, foodborne pathogen, but I think because we see some of these strains as uh, botulinal toxin producers. Any isolation of a clostridium that might be a butyricum in the lab, you should treat it with considerable care. And I think emergent might be too strong. Probably we now have more uh, means to identify uh, these organisms and that's, that, that's why we know that they are uh, clostridium butyricum, for example. Okay, so previously, maybe in the past, they were considered clostridium uh, botulinum as the symptoms uh, might have been the same. Mm -hmm. So these were the questions. You answered them all. Thank you very much. And I also may thank the audience for its attendance. Thank you for to the speakers. And I only make just one hint for you on the project website under the heading events you can find webinars and the recording of this webinar as well as the material will be published here later on. Please give us some time to process all the data and the files. Then we will put it on this public website for your download. So thank you to everybody, have a nice evening and I wish you all the best. Thank you for being with us this afternoon and goodbye. Thank you Christine for hosting uh, this webinar and thank you to all our listeners. Good afternoon. Bye bye. Good afternoon. Bye. Not bad. No.